watching a typical Steadicam move that Kelly is doing. Steadicam is a remarkable instrument. The original inventor, Garrett Brown, brought the idea to me back in 1974. Uh, he had a crude breadboard, and it took us about a year and a half and three quarters of a million dollars to finally get the Steadicam to where it was a good operating mechanism. Um, the concept is, is fundamentally simple, but it's very difficult to achieve. What we do is uh, Newton's first law of physics, I believe, says a body in motion will stay in that motion unless you disturb it. And so what we do is we have a, a complete uh, sled consisting of the camera sitting on top with a monitor and the power supply in the back. We spread out the total mass that the operator is supporting, and it's pivoted at about the center of mass on this free-floating gimbal. And then through the spring arm, you isolate the movement. You can see that it doesn't want to move. And then the second principle, of course, is that the human body is a perfect ser servo mechanism if you don't exceed its limits. You can run down the street with a glass of water and not spill a drop, but if you try it with a gallon jug, then you're in trouble. And the same thing here, the arm supports it so that Kelly feels like she's only carrying about two to four pounds. And that's the basic principle of Steadicam. It a uh, long struggle getting it into the marketplace, but uh, eventually now it's become a generic tool. Cinematographer has many responsibilities, such as setting up shots, um, framing the shot, choosing the lens, format, composition, um, the aspect ratio ahead of time, the lighting, and, uh, and very much involved with the director on the movement. But one of the things that I've always done as a cinematographer is I, whenever I've set up a shot, I've always been interested in how the, the scene was going to edit, how it was going to cut together. I think that's very important. You must know ahead of time exactly where everybody's going to look and what direction they're going to look so that the scene will go together properly. It, it drives me crazy when I see a scene where, example, two people are looking at one another and then you cut the singles and they're both looking left to right in their singles. Well, that doesn't make any sense because they, they're looking in the wrong places. One should be right to left and the other should be left to right. And what I try to do is I work with my operator also on eye lines because when you look at somebody and somebody was theoretically the way you set up a shot they should be looking at this person that, that would be in a certain place and if you don't really pay attention to where they look exactly they may look like they're looking at somebody else or some other direction and it doesn't make any sense and this is jarring to an audience you don't realize it when you're seeing it but it's not right it doesn't feel right there's something about it that doesn't quite sit right and it's a hard thing to describe in a definite way, but that subconscious plays a big, big role in how an audience views a film. It's quite a fun thing for me to be on this side of the camera uh, under conditions like this. Um, I wanted to talk about framing what the camera sees. And from an actor's point of view on this side of the lens, I see cameras and I see where they are. There's one up above me, there's one in front, there's, they're all around. And I know what they see because that's what I do, that's what I've done for my whole life. However, what does that camera up above me see? It sees mostly the top of my head and my shoulder and my profile. That is not necessarily what we see when we see the finished film. It's critical for a cinematographer to understand the difference between looking through the lens and seeing an image and seeing that same image on a screen or on a video. You cannot tell for sure what your color contrast will be. You cannot tell for sure what your uh, black and white contrast will be to get an image the way you want it to be 
you've got to have a lot of experience or have someone with you that has a lot of experience. Framing is critical. The operator looks through the viewfinder and he sees the sidelines. Those sidelines, in his interpretation, may be a perfect uh, composition. That doesn't mean that that's the composition that the cinematographer or the director have to see. That's what makes our business so uh, unique. We have to collaborate. In each department of shooting, we have to collaborate. But in camera particularly, the director must convey what he expects. The cinematographer must interpret that. He must know what the director has in mind. Unless, of course, he happens to be the director as well. But there's a third party in the mix, and that's the camera operator. The camera operator must be party to the conversations between the director, the cinematographer, and anyone else, the designer, whoever else is on the set that has any input into the scene. Some of the other uh, cameramen have been here have been talking a lot about uh, composition, lighting, and so forth, camera movement. And since I had the pleasure of working on the very first television picture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of television that I can remember here. Panavision originally were making lenses for theaters. In the, uh, this is the days when uh, anamorphic first started. Then a picture came along called Rain Tree County, and Rain Tree County was shot with the first Panavision lenses, which is the lens, one of them is right here in front of me. It's very large, very big, and very heavy. <laughs> you can see that here. But this picture was shot in this, uh, in this medium with uh, 65 millimeter film, so it was a beautiful, beautiful picture. Uh, after that, Panavision really didn't do too much in the motion picture field except for making lenses. Uh, it was sometime later that they started building their first cameras. They built their first camera, which was called a PSR, and it was a, a beautiful camera, and the main thing about it was it was a reflex camera. Now, to a camera operator today, that's heaven, because the old finders were really sometimes a problem. But they built this camera. It was uh, about the size of the old Mitchell BNC, maybe about the same size. But it was, it was, as I said, the uh, reflex camera. Uh, later on then, they built what is commonly known today as the Panaflex camera. They probably have made eight or 10 different models of this over the years, because the one wonderful thing about Panavision is they never stop improving. They're constantly building and making things better or newer. You know, Panavision actually started out making, uh, producing uh, anamorphic attachment when CinemaScope first came out and uh, we did a lot of work with, uh, uh, with MGM. And when MGM first brought the project over for their first movie, or our first movie, I would say, which was Camera 65 at that time, and uh, they wanted us to build a blimp for their 65 millimeter camera. And to tell the truth, uh, I don't think anybody at Panavision knew how to build a blimp. <laughs> so. Fred would attest to what he used, but that we built a box, basically with a square box, I would say three feet wide by three feet high by three feet deep. And the finder was on the outside. And, uh, you know, it's easy. I'm looking at the operator uh, framing us, but in those days, the framing was done by, uh, with a finder that was on the outside. 11 inches of parallax. Right, 11 inches of parallax. And certainly, if you're going to shoot somebody six, you know, six feet away from them, camera, you're, you know, you're quite a bit, uh, uh, you're angled quite a bit. You know, we never built a, a blimp before, and the, one of the first things is that on a blimp is to keep the noise inside and to make sure that there wasn't any sound leaking. What we did at one time, I can remember one night, one evening, is to put some beeswax, we burned some wax, put some beeswax inside the box and pumped air in it to make sure, you know, if there's air, if, if there's any black smoke coming out. Well, lo and behold, it held. So when we opened the box, there's this black plume of smoke come out to our face, and we couldn't get into it for one week because it <laughs> smelled so bad. So anyway, we, that was our first lesson. 
And then, you know, we had to build lenses. And as, uh, you know, we started out with only one lens. And we, uh, you know, told the production company, well, the lens is coming next week and next week. And finally, we were able to uh, deliver the lenses. But I've always tell the story that, uh, you know, without Montgomery Cliff, Panavision wouldn't be around. And what had happened during the production was that Montgomery Cliff got in a car accident on, I believe, on Mulholland Drive and turned over and broke his arm. So the film got postponed and gave us time. And so hence Panavision, uh, let's say, history is, you know, Montgomery Cliff. picture industry in our company's mind uh, started with Cecil B. DeMille uh, in a movie he made in uh, 1948 I believe it was called The Greatest Show on Earth in which uh, he had heard about our uh, cranes that were being produced at that time by our company and he had it imported uh, to Washington and it uh, made a very good impression on him and camera movement was a big issue and uh, we were able to accomplish that. And you can see examples of that in the way the cam camera moves in today's production. Uh, if you notice right here, uh, you're getting an example of camera movement right now. It adds uh, fluidity and interest to the action of the scene. And uh, continuity of movement and continuous action of the cameras is something that Mr. DeMille wanted in, in those days, and he was able to get it. And, uh, and it continues today with uh, other great examples, uh, constantly uh, keeping the camera in movement uh, when it's required for uh, the significance of the scene. Um, camera movement is being exampled here again on a dolly that we manufacture called the uh, Super Pee Wee 4. With that movement, uh, you get the grace of action that uh, enhances the, the scene. The uh, movement of a camera is one aspect, but there's also camera placement. So uh, we have uh, equipment uh, that has been brought into existence through the demand of the industry. And uh, by camera placement, they may want to be 50 feet in the air or even 100 feet in the air and maybe down over the side of a cliff and, and shooting up the, the side of a cliff to get the uh, continuity with the picture that's being photographed, and there's many examples that could be given. One great example that comes to my mind was a, a very famous uh, scene in a movie called A Touch of Evil, A Touch of Evil. Uh, it was shot uh, on the border uh, uh, between the U.S. and Mexico, the Tijuana, California border, and it was a continuous take that lasted something like 15 minutes. And uh, Troughton Heston was the star of this picture, and uh, very often I see him in interviews on television, and he always brings up that uh, scene. Uh, he was obviously very impressed with it himself. One of the great examples uh, that I can think of uh, in motion picture history is a picture called High Noon, starring Gary Cooper, in which uh, in this movie uh, he had been deserted by the entire town, and he was left to face the bad guys by himself. They placed the camera near his feet from behind him, and as uh, the camera pulled away, it started to arise, and it revealed him standing alone against an empty town and the bad guys coming down the street from the opposite end. And it added tremendous drama, as you can see here. The camera movement uh, can change the feeling of the picture dramatically. Again, with you have to bring the audience into the picture what they're seeing to involve them in what they see on the screen so objectively you have to set the visual so that, so that uh, they begin to understand what the environment is and what the actors what the environment uh, in, including the actors and where where they are now to move from the objective to the subjective is that you've got to have either somebody make a tremendous statement somebody do an action or create a moment whereby uh, all, the, all the emphasis from the objective shot moves subjectively. 
So therefore, you make a cut to a person on a reaction or a person uh, creating a reaction from another actor. And uh, I've got a little story I'll, I'll tell how it was accomplished by a Roman Polanski in a picture called Rosemary's Baby. He set up uh, the actors and the characters one by one throughout the whole picture. And little by little, maybe 10 or 15 minutes into the picture, he introduces another actor that will become an important part of the story overall later on in the picture. And so eventually, uh, half an hour into the movie, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour into the movie, we begin to know the actors and begin to wonder about the actors. He doesn't give you all the information he wants about this actor at the very beginning. He lets the information about the, the actor come out slowly, little by little. Okay, so now we have R Rosemary's Baby. We have, they've moved into the Dakotas in New York, Central Park West, and they've got their apartment, Mia Farrow and John Cassavetes, and they're rebuilding the apartment next door to them are an older couple, strange couple. Now we start to set up the story and eventually the kids finish their apartment and the woman next door, Ruth Gordon, comes, Mrs. Cassavetes, and she comes in, knocks on the door and says, uh, beautiful, marvelous shot of her. The door opens, you just see a crack of her like this. And all of a sudden, big close up and She's looking through the door. Mia says, oh, what is it? And she says, well, I want to see what you kids have done with the apartment. So she unlatches the door. Mia lets her in. And now we walk down the hallway. And so she says, do you have a phone? And Mia says, yes, in the bedroom. And she points across the hallway. And uh, Ruth Gordon leaves the shot. Now it leaves you with, with Mr. Mr. Cassavetes and Mr. Uh, uh, two actors and Mia. And as, as Ruth leaves, the camera moves in slowly to Mia. Now, cut. Roman says, Billy, give me a shot of Ruth Gordon on the bed in the bedroom. I said, okay, terrific. So he walks away, I put the camera in. I set up the shot and we see the door jam of the living room. We see the hallway. Then I see the door jam of the bedroom. Then I see the bed, and, and Ruth Gordon sitting on the bed talking on the phone. So we set it up, and we light it, and we say, okay, Roman, we're ready. He comes in. I said, take a look at it, Roman. Roman takes a look at it, and he says, no, no, Billy, you're wrong. And I says, what's wrong? He says, look, move the camera to the left. Move it to the left. Move it to the left. He says, good. This is it. And we, and we have the actors sitting on the bed. And he says, look at Billy. And so I looked through the camera, and I said, you can't see Ruth. You can only see part of her back. And he said, exactly, exactly. That's a mysterious moment in the picture. And he doesn't want the audience to know exactly what Ruth is setting up. And so we said, OK, all right, sir. so we shoot it. All right, dissolve, the picture's done. We go to the preview. That's at the Crest Theater in Westwood. And uh, Billy Castle, who is the producer, myself, we're walking around. I can't sit down through the whole picture because I'm nervous and wanting to know how the people accept it. I like to walk in and out and walk around and see, see the reaction, the body language of the audience and so forth working on the picture. Uh, we're looking at the picture. And so it uh, comes to that part. There's a knock on the door. Door opens. Oh, what do you kids do with the apartment? So what's the unlatches? We follow them down the hallway like that. They go into the living room. We, we pan with them into the living room. And then Ruth says, do you have a phone? And she exits the frame. And we push in a little bit on me uh, like that. Now, the POV, we cut to Ruth on the phone, and 400 people in the audience all go to look around the door to see who. That's an objective camera moving into subjectively and sucking the audience into what you want to say. Today's production, cinematographers are asked to work on tight budgets and really tight time constraints. And that just opens the door for a lot of challenges for the cameraman to do things like maintain continuity, whether it be lighting or frame or just location continuity. So one of the things I try to do, particularly in scenes 
where a lot of action is involved is to establish the geography of, of the scene early on because once the geography is established, then the line, the 180 degree line, which is so important for screen direction, uh, can be established as well. I can start to think about ways I might get out of a shot if it's not working or if we cross the line. Crossing the line is something you try to avoid at all costs, but sometimes your time does not allow for that or the action doesn't allow for that. So the thing to do is to think of ways to deal with that challenge, such as multiple cameras, if you can afford it. Um, overlapping action is really important, particularly in action scenes. If you can maintain the action throughout, excellent, but if you have to go back and repeat the action, it may not be exactly in the same place that it began. So what, what you want to consider is lots of cutaways, inserts, reactions, things you can give the editor to help cut away from the action if, if you do cross it, if you do cross that line and your screen direction changes. Other things that you can do certainly will be to set up your master camera on dolly or allow it to move during the course of the action so that if you were to cross the line, you've already established a move that you can cut back to. And now you've set your shot, the action is played out, and you need to get to the other side. You can dolly the camera to the other side of the room or the other side of the scene and use that as a setup for crossing the line. Once you've, once you've crossed that line, now you're free to continue the action. How you cross the line uh, can be the difference between jarring and confusing the audience or further exploring the dimensions of the location or the scene that you're in. And a moving camera can be one of the most effective ways to cross the line during a shot because now you are not, you, you're in motion and you can actually shift the perspective of what the camera is seeing and give the audience sort of a ride along with you and you don't have to uh, feel as though you've crossed any particular lines because the line is now moving and you've done that very effectively and created a dynamic uh, dimension to the frame.